I want to acknowledge the university and community supporters, the University of Iowa Honors Program and the University of Iowa's international programs for both contributing time, talent, and logistics to our organization. I also thank today's program sponsors, Midwest One and Taxes Plus. Our work is made possible by the general financial support from these sponsors. Our format, as you know, will include introduction of the speaker, our speaker's remarks, and then a question and answer period. You can write your questions on the cards on your tables and pass them up. They'll be collected after Dr. McHugh's remarks. So I'm particularly pleased to welcome my long-term friend and colleague, Mickey McHugh. She's a founding member and, f and a faculty member of the UI Global Health, is, Global Health Studies Program as an adjunct clinical professor in the Colleges of Public Health and Liberal Arts. She has been teaching health and human rights since 1997. Prior to coming to Iowa, she also worked as a primary care provider with marginalized communities. She also worked for a local women's clinic in the past 10 years in Iowa City. She has been active, indeed I'd say passionate, as a member of the Iowa Chapter for Physicians for Social Responsibility over the past decade. She's traveled, consulted, worked extensively as a peacemaker, researcher, and clinician. Please welcome Dr. McHugh. Well, thank you everybody for coming out. I'm really impressed and somewhat um, stymied because I know that in this room there's a lot of expertise on the issues of health and human rights as well. Um, and without further ado, uh, because our time is short and there is a lot to be said, I think, on this subject, I'd like to move forward. Um, and discuss a little bit about how I became engaged in this particular topic from the other side of the world, um, how the disasters have been unfolding and continue to unfold, who are the vulnerable populations to this issue, um, how is it that many consider it a disaster foretold, um, what's going on in terms of regulatory capture and how does that affect all of us, and how can we move forward? And are there lessons to be learned? And I look forward to um, the discussion. So how I was involved, why me, why Japan? Um, as Chris had said, I've been a long-term member of Physicians for Social Responsibility, as well as being extremely concerned about health and human rights. And Japan really is ground zero for nuclear threats. In Physicians for Social Responsibility, we um, work to address the gravest threats to human health and survival. And obviously, the nuclear threat is right at the top of that list. Um, when we went, uh, we were there to go over and um, evaluate 57 years after the bombing of Hiroshima um, and to discuss the fact that while no nuclear weapons have been used since then, there are tens of thousands of weapons that remain in the nuclear arsenal of the world, and we continue to pay for that in many ways. It was also 18 months after the Fukushima disaster, which uh, poses an unresolved threat not only in Japan, but potentially uh, in many other ways, as we'll discuss globally. So in Hiroshima, where we first met, were physicians, scientists, and civil society from around the world. It was a very exciting event, um, who were sharing their perspectives on uh, the nuclear th twin threats to global health and human rights 
and survival. And the setting where we met, for those of you who've never seen it, um, we went from uh, Hiroshima to Tokyo to Fukushima. It was quite the whirlwind uh, trip meeting with people in all of those sites. But what I wasn't prepared for when we got there was how really beautiful Fukushima is. And the beauty of the place belies uh, what has happened there. It uh, uh, consists of mountains and really lush forests as well as being along the ocean. It is the fourth largest agricultural source for Japan. So they produce rice, obviously you can see the rice patties, apples, tomatoes, cucumbers, livestock, fish. They also produce raw silk and other um, commodity crops like tobacco. It has a population of about 2,360,000 of which are their children. Uh, many of them are relatively poorer than some of the urban population as farmers and as fishermen. <clears throat> so to just quickly review the initial events, on March 11th, the uh, earthquake struck. This was an incredibly large, one of the largest earthquakes in the history of earthquakes. Um, however, it was not that much bigger than a couple of other earthquakes that had struck in that area. 17,000 were killed immediately. There were many, many injuries. Uh, those who were displaced were about 340,000. It shut down roads. It erased all the coastal towns. It destroyed buildings, um, both residential and public buildings. Uh, many were damaged almost beyond repair. And it also affected a local dam. And in doing all of that, it cut off electricity to the Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station where there are six reactors located. Then it was a cascade of events once the electricity went down. So there you have this humongous earthquake tsunami with all of the dead there. And within moments of the electricity going down, the population within two to three kilometers of the plants were instructed to evacuate. Those within 10 kilometers were told to shelter in place. But then on the 12th, there was an explosion. Unit 1 exploded. And those within that 10 kilometer uh, range were instructed to evacuate. At 4.30 that afternoon, they told up to 20 kilometers, evacuate. Meanwhile, the US is pulling out uh, US residents and telling them to move to 50 kilometers. At 11 the next morning, uh, Unit 3 explodes. In the evening, Unit 2 explodes. And those at that point, within 20 to 30 kilometers, are told to um, shelter in place. And then the, the disaster continues to evolve. And we began to hear some of it by the 15th about the helicopters trying to get uh, water onto the plant, the cooling rods in the spent fuel uh, rods and within the reactors all need to be cooled with water. Firefighters are being dispatched. Um, and then people, again, begin to evacuate. Again, remembering that these are people all within the territory of where the first disaster had struck. And then by the 22nd, almost uh, more than a month later, they draw a circle around Fukushima and tell everybody no entry. And I wanted to show this map um, just to remind you of what a complex eva evacuation pattern the people were enduring. And it wasn't actually until the 30th of September, many months later, six months later, that it was all finalized. So people were being moved and given um, contrary uh, messages. They were with and without electricity. It was very confusing those first few months. And they drew this restricted area, this concentric circle around Daiichi. But of course, the wind doesn't fall in a concentric circle. Most of the uh, pollution actually went um, north and up into the ocean. But some of it was blowing to the west. And so they also um, eliminated uh, population from that area. But all you see all the little green spots are little towns and villages where people were suggested 
they should leave. No one knew exactly where the hotspots were. They didn't know exactly how much people were being exposed to because a lot was going on simultaneously. And what we tend to forget when you think about these disasters is you think of these big numbers and you forget all of the vulnerable populations that are there. Japan may be the third wealthiest nation. However, it has, like every other nation, its vulnerables. And particularly of interest is Japan has a very old population. 23% of the Japanese are over 65. There was already a shortage of care providers for this population before the disaster. Children are um, at, a, at a real premium. There is a low birth weight, which impacts the national level of anxiety. Workers um, who were there at or um, now uh, working in the plant to clean up are many uh, are primarily unskilled contract workers, which means many of them are not from Japan. Many of them are from parts of China, from Vietnam, from Korea. They come in, they work a very short period of time because that's all they're allowed, and then they leave. So there's very little monitoring, very little follow-up possible for these workers. And then, of course, like any population, you have a subset of disabled and chronically ill people. All of these people needed attention simultaneously and continuously. And of course, there were the very immediate and intermediate and quite likely um, extended risks to the population. First of all, the, when you think about that horrific earthquake and you think about the flood that followed it, you can imagine all of the debris and the chemicals that were left in the wake of it from the shredded buildings, from the industrial parks, from the petroleum sites, all of these are extremely dangerous as well, and they produce a toxic soup uh, for the population. Nobody really knows what they were exposed to just from that particular component. And then you have all the people with their chronic stable medical conditions who are unable to access regularly needed care. There's a psychological damage for so many people of not knowing what occurred of their relocations, of losing family and friends. Um, and then there were several, because they were relocated, evacuated, given um, conflicting instructions, there were several who actually died in the evacuation process itself. The crisis, of course, was um, exacerbated by communication gaps between the government and the nuclear industry. The reports that have come out since um, highlight this major organizational and procedural failings. And finally, the complete cleanup, it hasn't hardly begun. It's likely to take 30 to 40 years. This is a disaster of unforeseen proportions and unexperienced anywhere on the planet to this date. However, there are many that talk about it as a disaster foretold. It should have been predicted and planned for. The earthquake and the tsunami were, not, were natural disasters of a magnitude that shocked the entire world. Although triggered by these cataclysmic events, the subsequent accident cannot be regarded as a natural disaster. It was a profoundly man-made disaster that could and should have been foreseen and prevented. This is from the Japanese parliamentary panel, which itself is trying to figure out its position in terms of what it does and doesn't say to the population in terms of um, concerns about their responses. Basically, when they talk about it, they talk about how all principal actors were unprepared for this event. Certainly, TEPCO tops the list. But then all the government actors, which are very, very tightly um, related to TEPCO, were all challenged as well even all the way down to the village leaders and mayors who really um, did not know what to do. The county, the Fukushima prefecture, the central government, the regulators, the emergency response system, the healthcare providers, and all the affected civilians, none of them really knew what to do when the disaster hit. Um, they had not assessed the probability of damage. They had not prepared for damage from such a disaster. They had not developed evacuation plans. 
so they were ineffective in preventing or limiting the damage. And many talk about how it was caused in part, and this is where I think it's an important lesson to us, by the pervasive public myth of absolute safety that nuclear power proponents have nurtured over decades and continue to nurture all around the world. And so the population continues to face grave concerns. The displacement continues. The disruption of their lives and lifestyles continues. Families remain uh, in disarray. The contamination of vast areas is only somewhat attended and understood. The health effects of chronic radiation exposure are a continual source of agitation among the population between the scientists and the health uh, healthcare providers. And all of this together has caused a great distrust of authorities. We hear this uh, from many of the people that we've been interacting with in the area. <clears throat> They also have some interesting responses. There is a reported discrimination and fear of Fukushima women because they are contaminated. They may um, have genetic abnormalities. Who wants to marry a woman from the Fukushima area because she may not give birth to normal children? The children are being reported to have begun to gain weight for the first time because of decreased activity. They're not allowed to go outdoors. They basically are spending their childhood sheltering in place. Um, and so they are developing a fear of nature. And as we all know, exploration in nature is part of normal human development that the children are being deprived of. There's increased rates of mental illness, alcohol abuse, physical ailments, things that you wouldn't expect, like deep vein thrombosis owing to inactivity on the rise among tens of thousands of Fukushima, particularly um, the elders. The elders feel very abandoned. We had um, a number of, of conversations with really sad elders because they had been living in these multifamilial dwellings where, or, or, I'm sorry, multi-generational um, dwellings. And again, this distrust of health experts. This is the first time I started thinking about the downsides of universal health care. Um, because when the government owns the health care system, the government sends policies in a way that at least um, a public-private setting is a little more, uh, you know, contentious or may have a little bit more ability to, to represent other interests. So I tried to look up all the recent data and talk to people about what's going on today uh, because the temporary housing was, was quite striking when uh, we were there. <clears throat> and of course, they are still there. And it is primarily, as I mentioned, the elders. But there's still about 10,000 homeless that are residing with friends and family because they continue to get these mixed messages about whether or not they can go back. And it was just last week that the government finally sucked up and said, you can't go back. We can't clean it up. We can't really evaluate it. So there are about 160,000 people who will never be able to go back home. But then there's all the, oh, I'm sorry, the other map that was up here. There all the edges around the evacuation zone. The men have gone back to work, to farming, uh, to uh, earning a living, and the women, as the caregivers of the families, won't go back. And so there are lots and lots of stories about um, disrupted family life um, because of this um, difference in understanding of what are the risks that they're facing. And then there's the whole issue of radiation, which is really um, a different issue. And it's because of its silence, because of its unseen nature, because of the history that the Japanese in particular know in a very different way than we do. Um, at the same time, they realize that you can't move all the people who've potentially been impacted. Um, and so there is this dread um, and of the unknown. What I found really interesting when we were there is this is decontamination. You have to take away the entire surface. For those of you who saw that old US uh, TV movie, The Day After, where you have all the farmers gathering and, and the um, 
extension people saying, you just have to take off the surface of the soil, and then you can go back to living there. Well, this is what they're doing. They've taken the surface of the soil, and they put it in blue bags. And you see it everywhere. There's tons of this stuff. And um, when I spoke in New York, that was at a year and a half, and the, the talk then was that the mayors there were saying they're really making no progress. And then the latest is that they are still not making any progress. Because what do you do with it? Where do you go with it? It's forever waste. You can't really decontaminate an area that has been so heavily polluted. They don't have the capacity to process it or to dispose it. It doesn't go away. It just keeps being recycled. There are millions and millions and millions of tons of this waste from all around the area. The other thing is that people don't know um, what they're ingesting. They don't know what they're inspiring. You can't see it, feel it, smell it, taste it. It stays in the environment, and it moves up the food chain. And some food sources bioaccumulate more than other food sources. Now, everybody didn't study this you know, in grade school. You don't know. For instance, you know one of the most bioaccumulative foods. We ate one of them this afternoon is mushrooms, you know, because it grows so close to the ground. Um, and so uh, in, even in Germany, all these years after Fukushima, if you shoot a wild boar, you can't eat it. It's contaminated because it eats truffles, right? Because of the contamination in the area, those truffles are very, in, from Chernobyl. But in Germany, this is in Germany, what, what it went over Europe, yeah. So people do worry. They worry because the contamination in the food source is found off and on. They can't um, check absolutely everything. And so they have these uh, recalls periodically since um, Fukushima. And you know, one time it's cod, one time it's trout, one time it's baby food formula. You don't know where it's going to show up. There's a lot of unknowing. And then I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, we are, of course, part of the Earth's biology. And of course, any of us who farm, you know you get some weird looking vegetables all the time. I mean, it's just part of life. But imagine if you were living there and you saw this flower or these vegetables or this very strange butterfly, you know, is it because you're living in a contaminated area or is it the random genetic? of the place. There's a whole lot of these sort of alarming uh, vegetables <laughs> online. You can look them up. Who knows? And that's the problem. You don't know. Um, and there are some biologists who are there looking at changes in the biology, in the Fukushima area, in the Chernobyl area. And <coughs> with shorter lived creatures, they are beginning to see um, genetic abnormalities showing up. And then, of course, few cancers ever identify their origins. I dare anybody to read the slide. Um, but I just put it up there to just show you all of the things that we often do study um, about what causes a cancer. And scientific disciplines all think differently. They gather different data. They come up with different conclusions based on the questions that they ask. And I, I love this slide simply because all of these things that influence breast cancer don't include any environmental exposures. And one of the studies that has come out recently talks about how if you happen to be one of the women who has the BRAC1 or 2 gene and you're exposed, you're more sensitive. So it's very hard to do population studies because of this um, uniqueness of, of each of us depending on our genetic heritage. Where am I in time? I tend to babble on. OK. <laughs> um, so the other thing that you hear if you start following the literature or you talk to people on the ground is, and including um, the scientific community here, no one died. No one got injured from this event. I mean, they really, there's a real effort to poo-poo what's going on. But even so, just recently out in The Guardian came the number 1,539 
who died of illnesses connected to the evacuation? Is it because they're staying in house and fearful? Um, is it because something uh, promoted an illness they already had? We tend to forget that um, exposure to ionizing radiation not only causes cancer, but it also contributes to heart disease, cardiovascular disease, and other um, non-cancerous conditions as well. And then they've set higher exposure limits for children and workers. Um, there is a global understanding of what are um, acceptable limits, and these are being changed now because they can't get to, in many ways, acceptable limits. So if you can't get to an acceptable limit, you change the definition. Um, and so, of course, people are asking, is this to prioritize uh, protection for TEPCO, or is it uh, prioritizing protection for the population? And then there's always that question, because of the way the chaos evolved, is people don't know their risks. They don't know their exposures if they weren't monitored at the time, and, or they could not be monitored at the time because of the chaos. And then um, I can't help but bring up some of the interesting articles that are coming out of the west coast of the U.S. Uh, we're having some of the same problems here. Uh, just, was it yesterday, out of the East Bay Express, was a big, long article about people there concerned, of course, what's happening with the water flooding into the Pacific and where is it going, the plankton and the bigger fish and the bigger fish and the bigger fish ca crossing the ocean. The consensus seems to be on one side, that it's too early to tell, it's too soon for it to have gotten there, or it's despite the tons of water flowing from around and contaminated sources going into the ocean, it's just a drop in the ocean. And on the other side, you have the people concerned precautionarily, well, why aren't we going to start evaluating? Why aren't we going to start looking at the fish? They actually stopped monitoring. They monitored for a few days after the disaster because of the airborne contaminants, and then they stopped uh, monitoring. So the residents over in um, San Francisco, LA, uh, San Diego, et cetera, all concerned, but there's nothing being done here. And the discourse there is beginning to sound a lot like the discourse in uh, Fukushima itself. And some of the problem is because the evidence is coming out in bits and pieces that there really was a cover-up. There was worry, this is on TEPCO's um, responses to the inquiry. There was worry that if the company were to implement a severe accident response plan, it would spur anxiety throughout the country. And in the community where the plant was sited, it would lend momentum to the anti-nuclear movement. <laughs> Rest my case. <laughs> So as I mentioned, widespread dis uh, distrust of government and un other authorities, and that's where it's kind of sad because it's authorities in the healthcare and the scientific community as well. So the population is very anxious. These are some of the lines we've heard. We consider this a man-made disaster. This is the general population. There are some people who speak as if the accident has been contained, but the reality is the contrary. Although we had unwanted exposure to the radiation, we've never heard any apology from anyone. This feeling I have will never be cleared, and this is an unforgivable murderer's act. And then the evidence of indifference with the Japanese government trying to sell nuclear power plants elsewhere. They're in the business. People really do feel that the TEPCO is working in their own interest to keep their jobs, their power, their economic privilege. People are still demanding um, radiation survey de uh, decontamination and um, compensation. And it's just in the last uh, couple of weeks that people have been finally talking about real compensation to that 160,000, for instance. However, there does seem to be some health effects emerging. No deaths, perhaps. Uh, but they have now found 26 thyroid cancers in children. This is usually the first cancer to show up after exposure. 32 of those children have suspicious biopsy results that are in process right now. This just came out a couple weeks ago. 
And um, from all uh, uh, background information, it likely represents an increase many times over baseline random incidence for the population. So this is a, a bit of a scary um, outcome for the people there. In addition, there are increasing reports about cover-up for the workers. This is also not unusual within industry. Fukushima workers were w made to wear pre-made lead shields over their badges. This came out, was reported in the Wall Street Journal uh, a year ago already. When you don't wear a badge or when you don't wear a badge that's accurate, it skews radiation studies. For those of you who followed some of Lars' um, history, Lar Fortis, he worked with the workers and found some of these um, experiences here in the U.S. as well. Um, so if you don't have a history of exposure, you don't get covered. And then, as I mentioned, m there's been thousands, 20,000s of workers have been through the plant already. And most of them are not Japanese. And so follow-up um, is going to be very difficult. And so secrecy, minimization, cover-up are all hallmarks of this industry. I should talk faster. Um, lots of headlines in uh, recent weeks. Um, as we heard here somewhat about the uh, groundwater contamination, uh, tritium exceeding admissible values 6,500 times, um, probably continued fresh leaks out of the uh, visioning units that have gone critical and are sinking into the ground. There have been petitions, global petitions, uh, for a global takeover of uh, Fukushima. TEPCO is slowly, slowly letting others in. They built the plant. They are not um, experts in decommissioning. There are some experts in decommissioning out there, but not for such a disaster. Um, and what else? OK. Um, the whole story that we could spend a whole lot of time on it has to do with the rods, the rods particularly in Unit 4. They've been damaged. They're taking them out very, very carefully. They just started this a week or two ago after a lot of noise uh, globally about it. Um, they have to be extremely careful. If you ever played pickup sticks and you pretend you were playing pickup sticks with pieces of dynamite, this is basically what they're doing. Um, and, and they can just pick them up very carefully, very slowly. If they drop one, if one cracks, uh, they could set off um, a major catastrophe that would affect all of Japan. There's um, uh, about uh, stories about victim blaming, like I said, in particular the women. They don't want to marry them because they may be contaminated. Um, there was pro there have been problems of all the di dislocated people, you know, moving into your neighborhood and they're contaminated. And are we going to interact with them? Kind of like you know the immigrants. Um, uh, somehow you don't want to interact with them. At the same time, uh, many Japanese are known to be particularly stoic, to not seek care, whether it's mental or physical health. And it's really ignited um, uh, bad memories from the era of uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima and former relations with the US. And as I mentioned, uh, Unit 4 is an issue for everybody. This is where the risks are at present. But then remember, there are the other three fuel pools to empty for the other three plants that exploded that are shut down. And then they have to dig these molten cores from the reactors themselves. They can't go anywhere near them right now. It's going to take time before they can even get near them to begin to pick them up. And if all goes well, if there are no problems, they're going to be lucky to see it all done in the next 30 to 40 years. Meanwhile, you know, who's going into this business? How many people are they training? Who are the experts? Try to imagine 20 years from now, you know, where the experts to do all this are going to be coming from. So a lot of people are talking about the whole notion of regulatory capture, the commercially, institutionally vested interests that have undermined our public health and our safety. The underlying issue is the social structure that results in regulatory capture, the organizational, institutional, and legal framework that allows individuals to justify their own actions. As you know, corporations are people. They hide them when inconvenient. They leave no records in order to avoid responsibility. My last slide. The right to health requires 
that the health of individuals be given priority consideration prior to, during, and after an accident. The state's obligations include the duty to protect the right to health of people against violations by third parties, i.e. TEPCO and the industry, to fulfill the right to health by adopting national laws and policies with the active and effective participation of the affected communities. Get them involved in what's going on. Listen to the people. Provide effective mechanisms to ensure transparency, independence, and accountability in governance. governance. None of this has happened yet. So the way forward from my perspective as somebody concerned about health and human rights is prevention, precaution, and the prioritization of the human right to health. The story, the protests all continue. We will be hearing about Fukushima for a long time. That's it. Thank you. Okay, I recently received a YouTube video depicting radioactive contamination across the Pacific, near to the US West Coast, as a result um, of the Fukushima uh, rea um, reactor. No other news source appears to have acknowledged this scenario, least of all the mainstream media. Is that fact or fiction? <laughs> Which part? <laughs> um, I, I think it's fact that the mainstream media has not covered the phenomenon. I think um, we also experience uh, regulatory capture in this country. Um, I, I don't know, and I don't think any of us know, how much of the contamination is approaching uh, the West Coast. Um, it makes sense when you look at ocean currents and wind streams and the movement of, of, of uh, marine life that it will eventually reach the West Coast in what concentrations, what amounts, nobody actually knows. It's predicted that, um, in fact, it may concentrate as much on the West Coast as anywhere in Fukushima as it keeps coming wave after wave. Um, and that some have said it may be as long as up into 2300 or, uh, you know, that we may see it because of the long life of, of many of the um, radionuclides uh, that are currently being dumped into the ocean. But the current status is really unknown. So fact or fiction about what's really happening is the answer is unknown. Fact that it's not being monitored very closely and it's not being reported, that is fact. Okay, staying in, Jap in Japan, are the non-Japanese workers lied to or coerced into working in the plant? Um, does this bring up the whole, <coughs> whole, mat excuse me, whole matter of trafficking and forced labor? And then I guess this is sort of slightly related. How do they take away the topsoil without creating dust? Wouldn't you then get a new, a new topsoil that is contaminated? <laughs> well, those are two real related questions. Um, I think the first one about workers is the situation that we're seeing around the globe, and that is that there are workers being trafficked, whether or not you know a substantial portion of the current workers at the plants are, are being trafficked from somewhere. I think, again, that's another question that nobody really knows. What we do know is that, for the most part, they're, they're drawing from very poor populations, desperate for employment, and they are being paid, and they're being paid more than they would have if they were unemployed and desperate at home. Um, the question is, you know, what is the actual interaction with them? And it is not being monitored. It is not being followed. It is not transparent. If you talk to people in um, the Fukushima area who are working on workers' rights, uh, you get a, a real range of stories about what is happening. But I don't believe that they're being protected in the way that they would be if the right to health were a priority. Okay, and another one in the same vein. Um, you said the farmers have gone back to work, to production. Is every bit of the harvest checked, and by whom? Well, th that was one of the more fun parts about being there, was that everybody walks around with a radiation detector. <laughs> It is truly amazing, all, all the little cooperatives and, and things, because um, it isn't uniform. You know, there are spots, 
here that are perfectly clear and, you know, 500 feet away, they get a high reading. So people are trying to find where they can grow and do what they want. But there are winds and there are rains. And uh, the people who live in the valleys around Fukushima are getting the rain that's coming down from the hills. And so while the contamination may be up there after rain, it's going to be down here. And and I think some of the issues about dust are, are very real. And I haven't heard anybody talk about dust, but the whole issue is that it is very hard to get rid of this contamination. It is very persistent. Okay. The Japanese Diet, the equivalent of Congress, um, said the Fukushima, that Fukushima was a man-made disaster. It was caused by the collusion between government industry and regulators. Japan's nuclear regulators are industry captured. Doesn't the same situation exist in the US? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at some other countries. Um, do you agree with Obama that nuclear energy should be an option in our future? Um, why or why not? I'm biased. Um, no, I don't think it should be. And I don't want to argue about cesium and strontium and plutonium and plenonium, <laughs> all the rest of them. I think the issue is, the real easy issue is the waste. And that's what we're dealing with for the most part in Fukushima. The waste is forever. And for us to get 20, 30, 40 years out of a plant of energy and produce waste for the next thousands of generations is just unethical beyond uh, consideration. It's also very costly, and it takes a long time to set up. How many windmills have we set up that equal um, a nuclear power plant? How many solar installations can we put up in what period of time that would include, that would uh, produce that amount of energy? The amount of energy that the world needs is um, now, and it needs it um, to replace what we have in nuclear, what we have in fossil fuels. It's not one or the other. It's get rid of both of them for our health and for that of future generations. Okay, still looking at other countries. Another country with extensive nuclear power is France. Could you compare the Japanese and French regulatory frameworks? And perhaps I could also ask you to touch upon Germany because that's an interesting contrast. Oh, come on, guys. <laughs> I'm not a politician. <laughs> um, from what I know about Germany is they're trying to keep those uh, plants shut down. Um, France, the population is beginning to equil equib what's the word? Uh, to quibble, anyway, about um, their use of, of nuclear. They've been very proud. They've been safe. They've had, from what I know, somewhat stronger regulations. But they haven't avoided the waste. There are um, increasing concerns about um, populations around their plants, around their waste fields, etc. I think um, the situation in France is unique because of their heavy reliance on nuclear. And I think things are changing all around the globe since Fukushima. And to be very local, um, Duane Arnold Nuclear Power Station, 33 miles upwind of Iowa City, has the same type of reactor design as the Fukushima reactor, which is a faulty design. Shouldn't it be shut down as well as the 20 plus similar reactors? Oh, from GE. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we have about 100 of them in the US, but 20 of them are GE, um, and similar to what happened in Fukushima. Uh, we don't live on quite uh, as active a fault line, uh, but it seems to me I recall some pretty awful tornadoes, some pretty awful floods, some pretty awful droughts. Uh, all of these plants are heavily dependent on a steady source of water. It seems to me Iowa has some real problems with that right now. Uh, Dwayne Arnold has uh, done a good job throughout its life. It's now been extended beyond its life. Concrete and uh, all the components of the plant um, have aging issues. Uh, I think it's time for us to reconsider what's going on with Dwayne Arnold also before we get into trouble. It's not, 
you know, an urgent emergency, but I think it's certainly something to think about. And we are downwind. How can the nuclear industry claim that this technology is perfectly safe while at the same time demanding the continued renewal of Price Anderson? Can we clarify what Price Anderson is? Mm. Okay. And okay. That liability themselves. Yeah, and that, that's part of the public discourse that isn't out there very often, is that um, the companies are no longer um, dependent for or responsible for any liabilities, particularly with regard to the waste. Um, the U.S. Uh, public is uh, responsible. And in fact, um, there's a lot going on with regard to Yucca having been shut down, no place to go with the waste. And it's the companies are beginning to sue the government for the cost of storage because we, quote unquote, the public have taken that on. There was something else in that question. Was that your question, Peter? Was there something else you... Yeah. Well, and again, similar. What's been the role of IAEA? IAEA, is it an objective act? Like I said, this is a global problem. The expertise lies with the industry, and even the so-called neutral actors, for the most part, are directly or indirectly paid by, hired by, promoted by uh, the industry. And so while I think there have been, over the history of the IAEA, a number of honest actors, there's some real questions overall about regulatory capture in any of these agencies. OK, now we'll really become philosophical. You say the state has a responsibility to protect the right to health, but the US doesn't recognize such a right. How do you square this conundrum? <laughs> you know, that's why I've been teaching since, what, 19? <laughs> um, I, I think uh, the U.S. is an outlier. We, you know, we are 4% of the world's population. We produce a huge amount of the global uh, pollution. Uh, we are so-called leaders, particularly in um, military, in uh, numbers of industries, and yet we don't follow the rest of the world. Um, the rest of the world does respect, in many ways, the right to health and uh, is pursuing additional um, you know, expansion and understanding of the right to health. While we lag way behind, we certainly don't respect the right to health. And you can find that out very quickly by looking at the health statistics from this country. And I think it's something that, you know, we all need to be engaged in. We all need to uh, begin to work because we are falling increasingly behind the rest of the civilized world. And the last and perhaps most difficult one is compare Fukushima to Camus's The Plague. <laughs> in, in one hour or less. <laughs> no, I thought that. OK. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of today's session. And I'd like to thank, on behalf of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council, Mickey McHugh for her talk on health and human rights in the shadow of Fukushima. Also, I'd like to thank our sponsors, University of Iowa International Programs, University of Iowa Honors Program, for their generous support. And we also thank our financial sponsors, Midwest One and Taxes Plus. So now, as a token of our appreciation, we produce the famous Iowa City's Foreign Relations Council mug. Thank you very much, Mickey. Should you wish to become an ICFRC member, support our programs with a tax-deductible contribution, you can visit us at the back of the hall, call us at 319-335-0351, or mail donations directly to ICFRC, 1120 University Capital Center, Iowa City, 52242. Thank you for joining us. We're adjourned.
You're watching City Channel 4. On TV, online, on demand, on Facebook, and now on the go on your mobile device.